So I'm very, very pleased to announce our next and first speaker. Soon you please enter the stage. Thank you very much. Oh, you uh, yes, thank you. Remember the singer. You have the clicker? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, first, just thank you for welcoming me to your community. I think that was a word that Henrik was emphasizing. And I would say I've been uh, hanging out with you guys for the last uh, two nights and uh, days. And I would say, um, you know, I feel a little nervous because I feel like I really need to up my game. I, I think what you are doing uh, in terms of how you're creating new customer interactions and the expectations you're setting for customers uh, throughout the world um, is really at the forefront. Um, I talk a lot about how iconic brands become iconic. And one of the key things that all the iconic brands have is something called timeless relevance. So it's not that they're just relevant today or yesterday, but that they'll be relevant going forward. So it's this idea of being sort of having longevity and being timeless. And it used to be enough where you had great name recognition and a little bit of word of mouth and you know, some nice affinity, and that was enough. Now people want to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with the brands they love. It's become much more personal. And therefore, personalization is an incredible tool to enable that. So I do want to talk about that today, because I do think it's highly relevant in terms of how you guys are building your brands to become timeless. Now, I have a question for all of you. Um, and be honest here. I want some honest answers here. You can and do it by raising your hand. How many of you have ever thought about, maybe someday I'll write my own book? Come on, show your hands. OK, yeah, OK, be honest. I, I think there's more people. OK, so just so you know, that was always in the back of my mind, probably for the last 15 or 20 years in my career. A uh, couple things about my career. Before I actually wrote this book and started going on the, the, the sort of the speaking circuit and talking about uh, iconic brands, um, I worked at a very small company that, uh, in fact, I was in their Lugano office for a little while, and then I was in the North Carolina office. Um, has anyone ever heard of VF? OK, a couple of you? OK. You might not have heard of VF, but you probably heard of one of our 30 brands uh, that we own, North Face, Vans, Timberland, uh, Nautica, uh, Napa Piri is actually one in Europe. And in fact, it was a large apparel company. And so in that experience of uh, learning how to manage the yellow boot or the Vans sort of uh, you know, slip on, uh, it really taught me a lot about iconic brands. And I researched 50 companies to try to understand what actually makes brands become iconic and stay iconic. Now, this idea of becoming iconic, what does it really mean? What's the power of becoming iconic? All right. So let's, let's sort of examine that. When you see these products, something like this, imagine getting a set of these for your very first job interview. And they were a hand-me-down from your grandma to your mother and then to you. Now, during the interview, you may never pull these out. It might still be in your pocket, it might be in your purse, it might be wherever. But knowing you have this and the history behind it gives you a boost of very quiet confidence. That is the power of having something that's very iconic, something that's very meaningful. In fact, iconic products are so powerful that they have the ability to tell others about ourselves to them. It helps our ability to identify ourselves in terms of the products we're using. So for the women in the room, are you a Burke or a Birch? Very simple question, right? Functionally, they're the same thing. They are leather sandals. And you know, it's a funny thing. I went to visit Tory Birch in New York, and I asked him the exact same question. And I was surprised by the answer. I thought all of them would just automatically say, oh, we're all Birches, of course. No, they said, it depends. Depends, right? Context, right? Depends who I'm with, what I'm doing, where it is, and, 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 and the environment itself. So if I'm going up to have a picnic in the hills, I'm going to wear, wear my Burks. But if I'm on Fifth Avenue or you know, in Regency Street, I am going to be shopping with my Birches. So let's sort of translate this to be a little bit uh, less uh, sort of gender specific. And think about it this way. If we were going to go to one of my favorite cities, Roma, okay, and we wanted to find two-wheel transportation to go from the uh, Fountain Trevi to the Coliseum, what two-wheel transportation would we choose? 
Thank you. Gosh, yes, the Vespa, right. But if we were in, let's say, Colorado and we wanted to sleep in the big outdoors and sleeping bags and take two-wheel transportation to Montana and Wyoming and then go visit Yosemite, what two-wheel transportation would we take instead of a Vespa? A Harley. That's exactly right. Okay? Both perfectly fine two-wheel transportation, right? But depending on the situation, the context, what we're feeling, we will choose something differently. And when we're using it, we feel very differently about ourselves and what we're communicating to the world. That's what's so interesting about iconic products. In fact, I don't know how it translates here in the, uh, in the UK, but in the US, when we don't feel so good, we actually have products that make us feel good by the sheer sort of iconic visual of them, okay? Chicken soup. You see, the great thing about iconic products is that they go beyond what you can see, what you think, to even what you feel to a higher place of what you believe, your value system, a belief about yourself, about the products, and how it transforms you when you use them and participate with those products and brands that are iconic. Now, what was interesting, when we looked at these 50 companies and we looked at other companies, and we looked at profit margins, those that reached the highest status of becoming iconic generally had anywhere from 3x to over 1,000x the profit margin of the next competitor in their category. And why is that? When you become the standard bearer, people automatically think of you first for something that they want, that you represent. So how do we get to this status? That's what we're going to be talking about. Right? And how does personalization actually fit with the ability to reach iconic status. Well, to pull that apart, looking at these 50 companies, I think we wanted to ask and answer one very simple question. What makes something iconic? And when we looked across the spectrum of all these companies that were doing this right, the Nikes of the world, the BMW, the Burberrys of the world, the, the Amazons, what were they doing differently to build their iconic brands? Well, we found that there were three dimensions that they all consistently shared in terms of building brands and businesses. And these three were, one, there was something very distinctive about those brands and businesses, something that made them stand out versus the competition. Very simple, okay? Now, that wasn't enough. You couldn't just be different for different sake. You also had to make sure that whatever your distinction was, it was highly relevant. And again, like I said, it's not just relevant today or yesterday. It's going to be relevant tomorrow. So this idea of you're timely, timelessly relevant for that distinction, for what you're known. And ultimately, what you do once you have that distinctive relevance is you make sure enough people know you and recognize you for that. And over time, with that recognition and that longevity, you then become the standard bearer that you become iconic for. Okay? So knowing that these are the three dimensions that all 50 of these companies were using and leveraging, how might you do something about these to supercharge them? All right? So we have a framework that looks at these three qualities. And the first, uh, first part of the framework really looks at, do you have in your business and brands great noticing power? Or do you look like everybody else? Is what you share and what you talk about, is that a platitude that any competitor can say? Or is there something about you that really makes you rise above the crowd or look very distinctly and differently? Something memorable, OK? So that's noticing power. The next power is really not just being relevant for this distinction, but being timelessly relevant, being able to stick around. That's the key if you want to become iconic. So you need that longevity. And lastly, if you have great Noticing power that is highly relevant. Are you making sure enough people see you and are buying your products? And that is called scaling power. Today, we're really going to focus on the idea of creating great notice, noticing power for us. It's the first step. And in the book, luckily, uh, 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 Henrik and Carl have been nice enough to make sure everyone gets a copy of it. Um, I talk a lot more about once you have a great Noticing power, how do you make sure that it's relevant over time? And then how do you make sure more and more people know you and give you credit for that? But today, we're going to focus in on the idea of noticing power. Now, I'd like to start and illustrate this idea of noticing power with a story. Back in the 50s, uh, if you recall, there was a big sort of, um, not an arms race, but a space race, right? Trying to get to the moon, the moonshot, OK? Um, and there was a NASA 
engineer by the name of M. Frank Rudy. I love that name, M. It's just one, one letter. It's great, right? So M's responsibility was to protect the astronaut's head from trauma. Now, he has certain constraints as a designer. Uh, when you look at the suits, they're rather heavy. They're rather bulky. So he didn't want to add a lot more weight or heft in his design. And he came up with something really brilliant that worked really well. M came up with the idea of putting air pockets in the helmet to protect the head from trauma. And it worked incredibly well. And it was incredibly cheap and incredibly light. And he thought to himself, wow, if it worked so well up there, what could it do down here? So he went and shopped this idea to a ton of footwear companies, okay, including a bunch that uh, I manage, uh, Vans, Timberland, I can go on, right? Um, and every single company rejected him but one. Do you guys know who that was? Yeah, Nike, okay, good. Yes, louder, one together. Nike, okay, thank you guys. That's exactly right, right? So in the 1970s, the tailwind came out, the Nike tailwind. Now we go back to our principles. Distinctive, noticing power. This thing flopped. Guess why? Because it looked like every other shoe that was on the shelf in the 1970s. The only way you knew that this had anything unique about it was through the hang tag or through the POS. And quite frankly, when they talked to consumers, seeing a unique feature through a hang tag or through marketing, their response was it felt very gimmicky. You know that word, gimmicky, okay? It felt kind of cheesy, right? And so this thing flopped. They took it off the shelf. They put it back into the Nike kitchen. A guy named Tinker Hatfield took over the project. It was in the vault for a couple of years. They brought it back out and said, it's, a, it, it's actually a technology that really works. So he brought in a bunch of designers, and he gave them two directions. And I think this is really instructive in terms of the directions he gave. First, if you have a feature, and that's true for your websites, that's true for your products, that's true for your services, if you have a feature that actually has a really unique and interesting benefit attached to it. Designers, make the feature and the benefit immediately and visibly obvious. So I don't ever need a hang tag. I don't ever need marketing. Brilliant instruction. The second thing he said was also very brilliant. Make it look sexy. Trust me, anywhere, anytime you use words sexy with designers, you won them over, OK? So that's what the designers did. And, and you guys know the story, right? Literally, almost 10 years later, in 1987, the Air Max came out. And what was so unique was not only that it had this beautiful feature that was immediately and visibly obvious, it was the way they actually merchandised it. When you went to the shelf, they actually had light coming out from the little pocket of air there, the little bubble. How many of you were actually around during 1987 when this launched? OK, about a third of the room. OK, we dated ourselves. Good. OK. I don't know about you guys. When I went to the shelf, I saw it. It looked very unique, because everything else kind of looked like that, right? And all of a sudden, you saw this, and you saw rays emanating out of a shoe. I picked it up. Obviously, I, I bent it, right? I poked at it. I did one thing that most people probably didn't do. I sniffed to see if it off gas, OK? But anyway, this is a great example of wonderful noticing power. It was very distinctive. And that distinction was highly relevant. Because think about it. Most trainers lose about 40% of their support during their life. But a pocket of air would never lose its bounce. Brilliant, right? So thinking about this idea of noticing power, a very simple way to boil it down is, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, when you think of legal entities, think of lawyers, think banks, what's something we physically do with our hands Okay, not fingerprinting, but we do with our hands that help legal entities tell us apart. Anyone guess? Signature. signature, exactly. It's our signature. So the question to all of you in the audience, and it's an important question. It's a very simple question. I've been asking a lot of you today, or the last few days, this, this one very simple question was this. What's your signature? If I literally were to pull three of your consumers or customers or clients, in a room, and I asked them each, what's this brand or this business signature? First, would they be able to say anything? OK, that's the first hurdle. Let's get to the next hurdle. Would they all say the same thing? OK, OK. And if they say the same thing, would it be something that sounded just like your competitor? Or would it be something that actually stood out and was different and unique and that you actually owned? And lastly, 
just owning it isn't enough. Would it be highly relevant and important and beneficial to them? Okay? If you answer yes, 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 then you've got a great signature, something that pulling three people off the street, they would all be able to say that was unique about you, that was highly relevant to them and highly differentiated versus your competition. That is your goal. And without doing that, it's really hard to become iconic. It's easy to become ubiquitous. It, maybe you might have great awareness, but you have very little relevance around something that you own. And that's the goal, OK? So how do we create great signatures? What are the different ways that you can create great signatures? Well, first and foremost, yes, you might have a great name recognition. You might have a good logo, all right? And we have a lot of businesses. In fact, I saw Henrik threw one up there, and I, I recognize a lot of those logos. But if you went and asked me in each one of them, What's their signature? I might not be able to tell you. So how might we accentuate the idea of signatures? And I'm going to use a lot of product examples, but at the end of the day, it's more than just product. I'm just using this as sort of a way to illustrate. So another way to create signature is actually through a signature feature. Okay? So obviously, I have the signature logo mark there, but they had a signature feature. And this shoe has been around for over 30 years. They continue to innovate on that feature. It went from a little bubble to uh, a much wider. It went front and back, and then eventually the whole shoe. Then they put in these air, uh, these power pockets. They kept innovating that feature, which was really amazing. Um, what other ways might you create a signature? How about style and color? When you see that checkered pattern, you know it's a sign of classic English elegance. If I said to the women in this audience, high heel shoes, red bottoms. Louboutin, did I hear that? Boy, you guys are very quiet. Let's say it. Louboutin, OK, all right. Louboutin, right? All right, men. Well, actually, women, too. What's the color of the Ferrari? Red. Lamborghini. Yellow. Porsche. Gray. Silver. Very, very close. They don't want to hear gray, but it is gray. <laughs> exactly, all right? So colors are really important. So same with style and patterns. How about this idea of a silhouette? In the US, there's a very popular refreshment. And it has a lime in its neck. Does anyone know what that is? Corona, exactly. And you think about that. It, most Coronas are basically naked without that lime in the neck. And that is their signature element to help you remember their key point of difference, which is they are the only vacation beer out there, right? They're not a Guinness. They're not stout. They're not whatever. They are the vacation beer. And when you see that lime, you think of the beach and you think Corona. Synonymous, right? OK. So silhouette, whoever thought like an hourglass shape would be really the symbol of quality in Japanese and Chinese restaurants. But it is. What other ways can you create signatures? How about through sensory? You're more likely to hear a Harley than actually see a Harley, right? How about this? Have you guys ever been and visited either the Weston or the Sheraton? When you go into the lobby, there's a signature smell, and it carries into the bathroom in their toiletries. So this idea of signature sensory. If I said jingles, if I said ba da ba ba ba, who's that? Anyone know? I'm loving it. McDonald's, right? OK. So sensory, music, all these things are ways to also own your brand and communicate something about your brand. How about this? Ever been to, I don't know, a, a Office Depot, a, a, a Dixon's, and bought one of these, took it home, took your scissors, you open it up, you still had to pry it open with your fingers, still very painful experience. Anyone do that? Yes? OK, right? All right. Well, another company figured out that that moment of unveiling the product should be treated more like unveiling a treasure chest. You guys know who I'm talking about. How many of you have kept an Apple, not product, package? All of you, right? It's ridiculous. Why? It's, it's a waste, right? And, and, and you know, the great thing about this, this Apple package, it actually takes longer to open up because there's layers, right? It's not like, it's actually, in fact, they time this. This takes twice as long to open up than that painful little, you know, um, this thing here, right? But yet, this experience is so much more enjoyable. And we keep the package? Interesting, right? OK. So that's a signature experience and a signature moment that Apple so rightly has owned. Smart. How about this? Do you guys know who this is here? 
Ever heard of Geico? Okay. All right. You know, so is Geico sold here? I didn't know if that was, that was the case. But no, oh, but you do know. Okay. Um, by the way, um, the U.S. folks know this. This is a spokesperson for one of the big insurance company. 15 minutes can save you 15%. Thank you. So signature slogan, right? Just do it. Okay, those are signatures too. By the way, to tie it back to where we're at, do you guys know who the voice of our famous gecko is? Anybody? That's right. By the way, he got fired from the job two years ago. Now they, they have to like, use consumer, con, uh, computer simulation to do the ge uh, gecko voice. But who's this guy? What's his name? Jack Wood, is that right? He's in the, what's his name? It enders, right, East Enders, okay, okay. Oh, let's see, I, I, I know a little bit about it, okay? I guess that's a soap opera, right? <laughs> okay, anyway, all right, so that's Jack, okay? So spokespeople can also be a signature. And lastly, this idea of a signature point of view. You know, if I said, um, uh, was it, uh, when you think of Red Bull, right? You think of the wings, okay? And you think of images of people jumping out of, I don't know, the space jump and then jumping off of cliffs and, and diving and all those type of extreme things because that's a signature point of view. So when you think about the spectrum of how your brand is remembered by people, do you have key signatures, experiences, moments, features, jingles that really embody your brand and your key point of distinction? That is the goal. So when we look at the menu of options to create great signatures, can anyone guess which of these is the most meaningful, the one that's associated with the highest relevance, and the one that happens to be the stickiest? Anyone guess? Experiences? Can I, can I, can I hear somebody say experience, please? Just anybody. Experience. Thank you. All right. Experiences. That makes sense? Because guess what? The thing with, uh, you know, and you guys heard this from Joe Pine last year. Right? There's goods and there's services. But the idea of an experience transcends that. It includes all those elements, but it also transcends those elements. Because experiences, think of them as men, uh, mini stories that live inside our heads, that we continually relive. And that's why they're so much stronger than products and services. Okay? So our goal is to create signature experiences that we do better than our competition, that people give us a ton of credit for, and that people will word of mouth to other people about, and that becomes our signature. So how might we create what I would consider the most important thing, signature moments, all right? Let me give you a very simple way of doing it. All right, so here's the goal. We are gonna build our iconic brands, whether it be online, offline, doesn't really matter, by having great signature moments that people talk about. There are really only four steps if you're going to do this. First and foremost, map the journey. I think we've all probably done that before, especially if we're doing UI, UX, OK? The next is, here's what's really critical. You only want to do something signature around things that really matter. So find in that journey the moments that matter more than other, the moments that index high on brand love, brand hate, OK? And then from there, and some people call these moments of truth, whatever you want to call them, but this is the idea of these moments matter more than others, okay? Pick one. Don't pick 20. Pick one first and create the light. Make it something that you own better than your competition, okay? Apple picked the opening, the unveiling. They own it better than everybody else, and they continually make it a signature, all right? And lastly, once you've picked a pivotal moment that you have made your signature, Build an innovation pipeline so that every single year there's something new coming out on your signature to keep it fresh and to remind people of your signature. By the way, that is the main criteria for great staying power is once you actually have a signature, you protect what is what I call signature about it, what's really iconic, call it the iconic signature element, and then you infuse it with great innovation, great story, and great design. And you have an entire roadmap and pipeline to do that. So that's what creates what I call great staying power. All right, so this is sort of the recipe we're going to use to create great signature moments. And I'm going to walk you through an example. So in terms of mapping the journey, I'm not going to go through uh, a lot in this because you guys have enough vendors that have already pitched you how to do this. I'm sure you've done this many times. But there are a ton of different techniques. For me, the simplest is, look, 
bring three of your clients, customers, and consumers together. That's all. And just sit down with them and just do a sequential mapping of what happens from point A to point B, whether it be on your website, whether it be a store, where it might be, OK? That's it. And guess what? When you collate those three and combine them, you'll probably get the 80 for the 20 in terms of most of the experiences that your customers are going to go through. So that's not the critical part, is mapping the journey. You don't need to get every single thing. You get them the things that they remember the most, and that's what all that matters, OK? Now, here's the trick, finding the pivotal moments. This I learned from BMW. You see, BMW realized there was over 1,000 moments from when you think about buying a car to when you research buying a car to when you buy or lease it to when you own and service it to when you sell or donate that car. There's 1,000 moments. But they've identified only 20 really matter. Okay? So first time you open and close that door, first time you turn on the engine, all these are things that they now design their entire engineering, product, merchandising, marketing around those 20 moments. Okay? So are, do you know what your pivotal moments are? And are you focused your organization strategically on over-delivering or at least making sure on some of them that you're not falling behind? Right? So how do we figure out pivotal moments? All right. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an illustration. And the way I did this, and to, to illustrate the fact that this is not difficult to do, is I said, I am going to figure out pivotal moments on the happiest place on the planet and figure out a way to make it even happier, all right, using this idea of pivotal moments. And I said, I'm only going to use what I have available to me on a Saturday afternoon in my house. And I did this about a year and a half ago, OK? Um, and so luckily for me, in my house on a Saturday afternoon, I had the world's biggest expert on Disney. Yes, it's this little kid here, my son, Brendan. He had been, I don't know, in the last five years in every single theme park, cruise ships, resorts, you name it, Disney on ice. Anyone done that? Oh my god, right. So you understand, OK? Disney was a big part of his growing up, all right? and he loved princesses. Um, and here's what I did. I said, Brendan, his name, OK? I'm going to give you. Instead of doing a journey map, I'm just going to give you a map. All right? You guys have seen one of these. right? This is, happens to be the Magic Kingdom um, in Florida. And I said, I am going to use a technique that I learned here in Heathrow. In fact, it was in the upper class section in the Virgin. And I took a, I, I took a snapshot of this proprietary technology to figure out pivotal moments. And the guy grabbed my camera and goes, what are you doing? And then I showed him this shot. And he goes, OK, never mind. All right. But this is my proprietary technology, all right? And in fact, this is overly sophisticated. Because for Brendan, he's like seven years old. I said, you know what? Don't worry about these. I'm just going to give you a green pen and a red pen. And you go onto that little journey map of, 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 of the, the Magic Kingdom, and you kind of tell me where you were happy and where you were sad. And that's what he did. That's him in the corner. And he started to mark these up. Now, when I do this with clients and uh, customers, basically, we end up probably just uh, telling them to give us a happy face, a sad face. We don't do anything here, and we do a sweaty face. Because sometimes they're not happy or sad. Sometimes they're just frustrated, stressed, or have high anxiety. So those are the three things I give. And guess what? Have your clients do that. Go to the map and put the places where they have a certain degree of emotion. And you'll find what happens. So he had all these reds and these greens. And if we zero in on the entrance, what's happening here? Hmm. I asked Brendan. Why are the monorails green, the ferry boats green, but the buses are red? Well, he goes, Dad, you know, fireworks over around 11.30. I'm pretty tired. I'm seven years old, OK? You know, and I go, yeah, I get it, I get it. OK, when we go to the monorail, we might have to wait for one monorail, but we'll usually catch the next one, all right? And the ferry boats, they're huge. But the buses are specific to each of the resorts in Disney, and they are first in, first out, whatever. It's FIFO, right? I think we decided that. It's FIFO, OK? The problem with that, is FIFO can take up to an hour. And one time it took us an hour and 15 minutes before we got on the bus. We had to wait four buses before we got on it. That was a long wait for a little seven-year-old when it was almost 1 in the morning. Okay? So for him, and you see up there where the little Mickey is, that's where the princesses are. He hated waiting an hour or two to see the princess. But once he saw the princesses, he was a happy camper. And so the happiest place on Earth, not so happy. Lots of cues. Tons of cues. So that's a pivotal moment. These all became pivotal moments on that journey. And that's how you identify pivotal moments. You literally have your clients go and your customers go and put happy, sad, and sweaty faces. And where you see a high index of them, that's a pivotal moment that you either need to improve or own. All right? 
So once you've identified those pivotal moments, find one to create the signature. And for us, it was really, um, luckily for me, I wasn't the only one analyzing Disney. This is an exercise actually done by Frog Design. They're kind of like IDO, they're very similar, okay? And Frog was hired by Disney to do this, and they came up with the journey map. And in the process, they ideated, how might we make the happiest place on Earth even happier? That was their question. And they came up with this. You guys don't know what this is? It's called the magic band, right? And what's wonderful about the magic band is the idea that not only did you get your own magic band, okay? but it helped reduce queues because you didn't ever have to register or pay for anything. You automatically walked up and it already knew who you were. And in the, it was even better than that because the minute you swiped yourself in, it knew who you were and the attendant would call you out by name and say, Carl, it's good to see you today. You were here yesterday. You left your jacket over in the town hall. We got it for you. And I know it's your birthday today. We have a cake waiting for you, you know, at um, our, one of our restaurants. Great. Imagine that for a, like a nine-year-old or a seven-year-old being greeted by their name, being recognized for, oh, you were with us in Animal Kingdom last time. We know you love the tigers. Whoa, that's really powerful. So beyond sort of reducing the cues, it was actually a moment of celebration. It was a moment where it turned into a signature moment. And I talked about this also. The idea of innovating the benefit. They came up with this idea of the magic band and the swipe at the entrance. And they decided, look, we're going to innovate like crazy on this. So there's a whole sort of spectrum of experience before the park, in the park, and during the, uh, during the park and after the park. Before the park, once you buy your tickets and all that, they send you a great greeting and email and basically have an online experience where you can customize your own personal band. Color, character, put your name on it. Then it arrives at your office or your house. And then you enter the park and you have that magic moment where they greet you by your first name and know all the stuff about you. And then while you're in the park itself, it kind of knows, oh, Carl, you're, you're a big Pirates of Caribbean guy, right? And guess what? You're like 100 feet away, and right now the queue is as low as it's ever been. Drop everything you're doing, go right to the Pirates, OK? And, and so then it's connected to your mobile device. And, and guess what? They have this experience where you can order a meal for your 20 friends and you, and you can be two hours late for it, OK? It doesn't matter because it knows where you are in the park. And it knows it geolocates. It knows when you're about to approach the restaurant. And their promise is, no matter how early you are, no matter how late you are, no matter how many people you actually have, you might have said you were 20 and you only showed up at 17, it doesn't matter. They promise to seat you and have the food that you ordered on your table in five minutes. Wow, right? And obviously, after you leave the park, you know, you can, you can have um, your photos and a whole bunch of other stuff associated with this idea of having a relationship, history, and information highly personalized to you. OK? So that's table stakes now as we think about becoming relevant to the people that we want to be iconic to. Now, one thing that we've heard a ton about is this idea of frictionless. Who's not heard of frictionless, OK? And that experience there, yes, it initially started out with the idea of how do we reduce cues? Important question. How do we reduce friction, OK? But it wasn't enough. And this idea of frictionless doesn't go far enough. And the idea of current personalization doesn't allow for going beyond the idea of frictionless. So let me explain. Let me give you a story here. All right. Who has not watched Lord of the Rings? I'm assuming by the fact that everybody, oh my god, three people there have not watched Lord of the Rings. All right, this is not relevant to you, OK? All right, <laughs> tune out, please, OK? But for the rest of you, what is the goal of the Lord of the Rings? Destroy the ring, OK, pretty clear, right? Now, if we were charged with this task, all right, all of us here, we were charged with that task. We would probably have an offsite. Guess what? They did the same thing in Middle Earth. They had an offsite, OK, in Rivendell, right? OK, all right. Now, part of the issue is they didn't have enough gender diversity. So I think the solution they came up with sucked, OK? But if it was us, we'd come up with a better solution. Let me explain the solution they came up with, all right? I think it's full of problems and holes. All right, first and foremost, I think they picked what I would consider a little more suspect ring bearer, all right? And then they decided to say, hey, you know what? 
Let's spend a year going over mountains and through caves and through swamps and through spiders and through orcs, all right, to get to the eventual place, Mount Doom, right, to what was it? To destroy the ring, okay? Now, we're brilliant, right? All right, we would have had our little offsite, and instead, we would have come up with this solution. One, we would have picked, I would say, a little more reliable ring bearer. Is that fair? Okay. And we would have chosen what I would consider the equivalent of FedEx in Middle Earth. What is the equivalent of FedEx in Middle Earth? Eagles, right? And we would have just said, hey, Gandalf, put the ring in some protective box, put it around this guy's neck, jump on the damn eagle, fly over an hour, and drop it in the mountain, and we're done, right? <laughs> okay, frictionless, yes, right? Boring, right? <laughs> so the trap of becoming frictionless is this. You see, not all friction is going to be created equal. In fact, it's about the hero's journey. That's what they went on with the Lord of the Rings. And when you think about it, it was full of friction. They went from being really happy to this, what I call the valley of inspiration, right, where they were really depressed, they were frustrated, they were angry, right, things weren't going their way, okay? And then they climbed out of it through courage, through endurance, through perseverance, all that's friction to get to that higher plateau. Instead of doing a straight line shot, they had to take that dip, and that to me is friction. What is thunk about this? What's all this about friction? Because it's not all created equal. There's a new concept. It's not just about bad friction, which yes, we need to get rid of. It's about adding good friction, okay? It's about resistance, conflict, effort that results in the positive, all right? There's something gratifying about good friction. Think about consumer outcomes, business outcomes, and some examples. Bad friction, we all know. Yeah, everyone's frustrated, angry, you know, and you lose people, people switch, people become apathetic, you get poor reviews, and all these are the examples, and we all know those really clearly. But good friction, on the other hand, really is about engagement, about creating gratification that requires effort, okay? And justification, you know, sometimes if things come too easy, guess what? You don't appreciate it, right? So this idea of I had to work at it. And the other idea of, you know, I actually identify that because I actually put effort towards that, all right? And that leads to great loyalty, repeat, word of mouth, all these positive things. And that, that, that's in the form of the right information at the right time, interactivity, and great stories. So those are the design principles, all right? So what you want to do is get to this blank canvas so that you can draw on it. Think of friction as this. First is you want to wipe the slate clean. So that's getting rid of bad friction. And then you want to paint your Monet on it, and that's the good friction. All right, so simple design principles really are focused on one. This is written about, you, you, you type in frictionless, and this all stuff comes up. I'm not even going to go through it. You guys know this, right, OK? But what's really more important is adding good friction. It's delivering timely education and information. It's about increasing their engagement in a way that it's enjoyable and entertaining for them. And lastly, it's about inspiring them to be bigger than they are, to think bigger than they are, and to identify with something that they care about. And lastly, this is really important, OK? This is where the idea of the contextual personalization is so critical. Because if you have too much good friction, guess what? It becomes bad friction. If you have irrelevant good friction, it becomes bad friction. So you just have to have enough of the right friction at the right time. So context of these three things are critical. And when I'm talking about context, it's got to be personalized for the individual, not for groups, but for the individual, for the environment. Where are they? What are they doing? What are they using? And lastly, what's in their head? And what led them to where they are at that moment and what they want to do? Knowing those things are critical because, again, you're adding in friction, which is a very interesting commodity. By adding in friction and the wrong type of friction, it becomes bad friction quickly. So in order to do good friction, you have to personalize. And it has to fit the context. That's really important. And when you guys are thinking about adding this good friction, are you armed with this type of information? Luckily, I sat with some people that are actually doing this well. Because guess what? I, I was sitting with Elena, and she was talking about how they had the right tutorials at Leroy Merlin in terms of having the right information at the right time. What about this? 
We had a whole team, a great, the great team at John Lewis, right? We got Joe, we got Karen, we got Jack, okay? Yeah, it's all about this idea of having the personal shopper and this type of interactivity, right, to engage with the uh, clients. And lastly, I was online listening to the story of Thomas Burberry. I loved it, okay? Stories that inspire us, to make us reaffirm our identity with the brands that we care about. These are all great examples of you guys already doing this. It's fantastic. So let me just end with this thought, okay? Key takeaway is this. Look, you guys need to create signatures and do it through signature moments. Moments that stand out, moments that help create word of mouth recognition for what you guys are going to be known for, what people care about. Yes, we got to create that blank slate, so reduce the bad friction. But don't forget to do this. Add good friction and do it in a way that's contextual. Otherwise, it'll become bad friction, right? Now, I'll end with this last thought. I, I talked to a lot of folks that came out of, I think there was a meeting yesterday with some of the retailers. It was a cab meeting. Um, and I think I talked to three of them. And they all said, we are, well, one of the big takeaways was, you know, no matter how different we are, we're surprised about how similar we are in terms of the problems we are all facing. Now, you guys want to go and do hyper-personalization and rethink personalization? We all know that that's the promised land, and we all know consumers are going to expect that. But we also know the journey to get there is wrought with a lot of what I call dips, right? What, what, what's one of them? Legacies, silos fighting for the lack of very limited IT resources and, and budgets, right? All those are things that you are going to have to overcome in order to add good friction, okay? But I, I think what's really encouraging is I want to end with the thought of community, what Henrik said, okay? You guys have each other, and part of it, I think, the takeaway yesterday was that there was a lot of shared best practices along with a lot of shared pain. There was a lot of shared ideas of what people are doing to tackle those common issues and common problems. And I feel very encouraged because only after literally spending an hour with my dinner team, we went through our hero's journey together, okay? We threw out all these ideas. Some of them stuck. Some of them didn't, okay? <laughs> You know, we had a lot of, what do you want us to do? What? You know, and, and uh, we were arguing whether or not a sock was red or purple for at least 10 minutes, okay? And eventually somebody took it off their, sh their, their foot and it smelled bad, but that's okay, right? Jorge, okay, all right? But we got to the promised land. And here's the great thing. With this community and shared best practices and ability to collaborate with each other, reach out and support each other because you'll end up like us, right? A group of folks in hot water with our backs against the wall, OK? But we literally had each other's backs, OK? And think about this. This group, in literally spending, I don't know, it was only a half an hour, really, before we got into the pool together, right? OK? OK? Right. OK? Was courageous enough to be able to paint this big toe here. So if you guys can overcome and paint toes, there's no way that we aren't going to be able to overcome legacy and, 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 and silos and lack of resources to get to that great personalization. So the rest of today is talking about how do we enable the ability to create a signature through great friction. And you're going to hear a lot of speakers that are going to tell you actually how they're going to help you on that journey. Thank you guys very much.